Shall I work for, wait for uh, Jay Feinberg? <laughs> Okay, Professor Feinberg, it's, it, it's good that you're here because I had planned to start uh, addressing some words to you. So, oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry, so, <laughs> yeah, so yeah, you, we, we have not had the chance to, to interact yet as opposed to uh, previous uh, speakers. Um, but I have uh, read a couple of things from you and uh, I would say how much I am honored to be uh, invited in this uh, in this. Uh, Fest because you are celebrating your your birthday apparently. I'm not really. They are. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> okay, so disgregation of uh, of liquids. Um, I will explain that this is not um, a, a misspelling and that there is um, a history behind that. As a matter of fact, I would have liked very much to to talk about things which break when they are solids. But I was not smart enough to be put in a fracture session. I have been assigned a <laughs> fluid instability session, which is, which is, I mean, not so bad for me uh, uh, already. So I don't know who designed this. Uh, this, is, this is a picture on the, on, the, on the poster. It is very nice, very beautiful. And, I, yeah, and indeed, I would have liked to speak about some of the things which are represented there, like the broken window problem, um, the breakup of cohesive objects, the fracture of brittle uh, solids. But I've been assigned a, a liquid session. Um, and, and then I realized also on the program that somebody was uh, talking about uh, liquid sheets after me. So I would have liked to speak about liquid sheets, but I had to pick up another subject. <laughs> you're free to speak about whatever you want. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> All right, so, so I, I asked for an advice to Pierre Simon de Laplace what um, I could uh, say about things which break because they are cohesive but liquid. So, as you know, Pierre Simon de Laplace has um, explained to us a couple of times, a couple of years ago, two centuries ago, uh, why cohesion was responsible for the shape of macroscopic objects like <coughs> many sky, um, so bubbles and uh, stuff like that, minimal surfaces. And in fact, um, a little bit later, that was the big discussions on um, the foundation of thermodynamics at that time. Rudolf Clausius uh, came out with a, a co the concept of disgregation, precisely. And in his mind, disgregation was the amount of mechanical work thermal energy can make. So this was a pre-entropy concept, the idea of disorder, disorder activated by thermal fluctuations. That concept has disappeared now, it is not taught anymore in thermodynamic courses, but that was a, a, a kind of an equivalent of the entropy um, notion. <coughs> so this, the wealth of phenomena around um, the way things as they are uh, perturbed by something, may it be thermal fluctuations or a mechanical action from outside, the wealth of phenomena accompanying these actions, and particularly those involving fragmentation, are those I'm interested in. And I'm going to uh, present to you an experiment precisely addressing this question, and which was conceived with, uh, in the following spirit. We want to start with an object which is as simple as possible so that we are not annoyed by geometrical um, complications. <coughs> and we want to have a situation where um, we can describe step by, by step all the intermediate ingredients from the initial cohesive object to the uh, stable fragments uh, afterwards. 
Unfortunately, since I have been assigned to an in instability in fluid session, as you will see, it involves an instability. All right. So what's the phenomenon? The phenomenon is to start with a very simple object, an approximation of a spherical ch shell, a bubble, a liquid bubble. There is, there is not even, as you will see, a uh, surfactant um, built in this object. This bubble um, <coughs> is inflated with a mixture which is reactive. As opposed to the chemical reactions we have seen before, this is an exothermic reaction. Uh, which releases a large amount of energy, which is transformed into uh, an elevation of temperature of the burn products. And therefore, this chemical reaction expands the medium inside the bubble. This is the reason why the bubble, which is violently um, inflated, um, will respond in some way which we have to understand and fragment. All right, so we want to document the expansion dynamics, the shell stability, uh, and the ultimate fra fragments. And in fact, uh, <laughs> that setup was uh, suggested to us by, um, by Marangoni. Uh, as, as you know, uh, Marangoni was, uh, was basically a teacher. Uh, he wrote... Um, many things related to his um, uh, experiments in the lab related to his uh, heavy teaching load, we would say nowadays. And uh, this is exactly what, what he says. So Sergio, if I, if I made a mistake, you just let me know. Uh, so he's basically saying that it is, it is, it is well known that uh, if you inflate uh, a soap bubble, it is ascending in air, so that's true because hydrogen is extremely light, so the, the bubble is ascending. And then if you, if you with, a, with, a, with a candle or with a wick, if you fire it, <coughs> it, it produces an explosion. Unfortunately, it is safe. So this is also the reason why we allowed ourselves to replicate this experiment in a CNRS lab um, <coughs> in France. <laughs> because it was safe. <laughs> All right, so the, the formation of the shells um, involves... Excuse me. <laughs> As you can see, we are many when we are... Um <laughs> uh, so, yeah, the, uh, the shell is made by uh, uh, using a kind of coaxial geometry. The mixture, the H2O2 mixture is in the center, and... There is an outer jet which um, uh, produces a, a kind of a liquid, uh, a liquid tube which um, uh, uh, isolates periodically bubbles by a capillary, a simple capillary instability. So there is a relationship between um, the uh, thickness of the uh, shell versus the radius of the uh, bubble. Um, linear relationship and as you can see the order of magnitude of the uh, liquid thickness is uh, tens of microns this is much thicker than a soap bubble and the radius of the um, the radii the typical radii are uh, of order centimeters so this these are macroscopic uh, objects all right so this is not not really a tabletop experiment because the um, the bubble is uh, uh, sitting in between two uh, lenses, so there is a Schlieren apparatus which uh, is useful at um, looking at what happens uh, when we ignite the mixture, the propagation of the flame itself, and the fragments as well, so vi the visualization is, uh, is a little bit delicate. There is a laser which is used, a, a powerful laser which is used to uh, ignite the mixture, and then there is a couple of photodiodes uh, to synchronize the whole thing. And be because we don't need we don't need the soap. The the um, uh, the, uh, the shell is formed by a capillary instability in the form of something which is more or less miracle, and we don't need any soap. But you'll see uh, we can we can do this in a, within a soap bubble as well. You'll see. 
So yes, this is a typical uh, instant of time after the uh, mixture has been uh, released, and we want to describe this. In particular, we want to understand why there are holes on the shell, and we want to understand the uh, final uh, droplets which are starting to, to appear at this uh, stage of the problem. Excuse me, I didn't hear the last question. Is it, was it a question of what the liquid was? No, the question was, was why is there, why I, are you not using soap? And the answer is, we are using soap, as you will see. But it is not mandatory. Soap and water. Soap, yeah. So, and Soap, yeah, uh, soap films. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to understand what it is. So precisely. So this is made. This is what you have just seen was in a, made in a soap bubble which was sitting on a petri dish. All right, so that's. And you've, so the purpose of these preparatory uh, experiments, if you like, is to image what happens when you ignite the mixture inside the shell and to emphasize also the role of what the combustionists uh, know as the uh, mixture ratio, that is the. Uh, relative proportions of the uh, hydrogen and oxygen on the rate at which, on the, the flame speed, so the rate at which the uh, chemical reaction occurs in the, in the system. Oh, this is much slower. This is slow. So you'll see the time, to give you an idea, you have, this is, this is the uh, flame propagation velocity, so the, the flame which is inside, okay versus the famous uh, equivalence ratio. Of course, the, um, the flame propagation velocity is maximum close to the stoichiometry. Uh, otherwise, the flame has to heat molecules which in the end will not feed the chemical reaction. And this is the reason why the flame propagates slower. Um, and you see the, so the, 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 the typical time scale is a fraction of milliseconds. And you will see there are even shorter uh, time scales. All right, so inf interface dynamics, precisely. So we have, in this program, two interfaces. We have the flame front, RF, and of course, we have the radius of the uh, spherical shell. Okay. And so the Schlieren apparatus is used for that. So the Schlieren has, maybe there are there are people who don't know what the Schlieren apparatus is. This is a, a, a device which <coughs> is aimed at um, contrasting even very weak density differences through the uh, differences of this index of refraction. Yeah? Well, in, in bikini, they are not using uh, liquid shells, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's the point. But that's the point. The ah, maybe the, your point is, is, are the structures on the liquid sh shell reflecting yeah, instabilities yeah. of the flame front? Right. So that's a very good question, and the answer is no. Uh -huh. The reason is that we are working with centimeter sized uh, uh, spheres and um, uh, at the equivalence ratio we are working with, the flame did not have time to destabilize. The flame front has not destabilized yet as it reaches the, uh, the liquid shell. If we had let the flame expanding further, then the intrinsic instabilities of the, f the, 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 the flame front, the Landau instability, would have time to, would have had time to, to develop. So that's a very good point, but the, the answer is clearly no. <coughs> okay, uh, as you can see, by the way, uh, the, the, the flame front is, uh, is smooth there. And, and it has already appreciably accelerated the, uh, the liquid shell. All right, so we have two interfaces. One interface, which is more or less trivial, which is the, um, the flame front, and another one, which is the one we are interested in, um, which is the liquid shell. And the liquid shell, as you can see, <coughs> is extremely violently accelerated. So there is a T cube there. The radius is proportional to time to the power three. So we need to understand this. 
So you see, this is exactly this expansion dynamics and the formation of holes afterwards. All right, so yeah, precisely orders of magnitude to have an idea of what matters in this problem. The pressure scale is the driving force, if you like. The pressure scale in this problem is the stagnation pressure constructed on um, the um, uh, flame front velocity. What they call in the uh, combustion business the recoil pressure because the flame front separates two uh, media with different densities. The reason being that the cold, dense fluid is converted into a um, uh, lighter um, uh, and at high temperature uh, fluid. So there is an interface of density. And since there is an interface of density, there is a jump of pressure from uh, both uh, uh, here and there from the flame front. That um, ingredient, that what we call the, the recall pressure, is um, extremely small compared to the driving force. So we won't uh, take this into account. The Laplace pressure, the Laplace pressure because we are sitting inside a shell, so the shell is spherical, and there is therefore, because of the radius of curvature, a pressure jump because of surface tension between the inside of the um, bubble or shell and the outside. The order of magnitude of this is extremely small precisely because we're working with centimetric uh, shells. Then the viscous stresses, um, they're vanishingly small, of course, at the beginning of the expansion because they require uh, the motion to be set in and at, uh, uh, at early time, the, um, if you want to understand the, the early acceleration, uh, precisely the velocity is zero, so the vis viscous stresses are evanescent. All right, so since we have a problem where there is uh, essentially one pressure, the, 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 problem, the problem is extremely simple. <coughs> it's a relais placé kind of uh, dynamics. Of course, we have on purpose chosen a um, problem where there is only one geometrical characteristic uh, scale, <coughs> direction, a radius. Relais placé. Don't forget placé. So yes, relais placé, as I have just said, uh, which is responsible for expanding the whole thing. The pressure source being precisely the stagnation pressure at the flame front. Now, this pressure uh, is used by the system at three things, basically. Accelerating the rest of the universe, all of us. Accelerating the liquid shell itself. And accelerating the gas just in front uh, of the uh, flame front. Obviously, when the flame radius is, uh, is small, this is dominant at short time. And when we are working with small, um, <coughs> uh, small thickness uh, shells, this is indeed the first term which is uh, dominant at short time. Obviously, since um, this radius is a, is a linear function of time, we recover here the fact that the radius it's a double derivative here. The radius goes like the cube of the radius of the flame, but since the, the, the radius of the flame is proportional to time, we recover the uh, TQ blow here, which is uh, shown here for different um, uh, flame propagation uh, conditions like the equivalent ratio, for instance. All right, so the TQ simply originates from the fact that there is one pressure scale, the stagnation pressure, which accelerates something which uh, is, in fact, the layer of unburned gases just in front of it. All right. So since we know now the kinematics of the basic, uh, of the, of the, of the um, uh, basic state of the system, if you like, since we know the di what, what uh, rules the um, uh, basic state of this expansion, we can now address the stability of the uh, corresponding situation. So, Rayleigh was already mentioned this morning. It was Rayleigh lamp. You will have to tell me, by the way, 
how Lamb was involved in this because but anyway, yeah, the <laughs> Relay Lamp. Yes. So you will have to tell me what the specific contribution of Lamp is in Relay Lamp. The Relay Lamp equation you should. Uh, well, Lamp wrote down the equation, and isn't, isn't he before Rayleigh? So sure does enough. that mean that it's uh, Rayleigh? <laughs> All right, the, the, so that. The <laughs> <laughs> no, Rayleigh is 1872. So. All right, so that, that's. Uh, that's so this is the same relay. This is what I wanted to. And this is relay Taylor. So this is uh, relay uh, 1878, Taylor uh, 1950. Both relay and Taylor, and in particular Taylor, missed an extremely important aspect of their uh, instability. This aspect being that when a layer of finite depth of fluid is accelerated perpendicular to itself, it is unstable in the sense of Rayleigh Taylor. However, there, are, there is an important correction, and when I, when I say important, you will understand why. There is an important correction involving the thickness, the finite thickness of the layer itself. That was demonstrated, that was discovered, let's say, by Keller and Kolodner four years after the contribution of Taylor. And it is an important correction because it shows up in the growth rate of the instability. The, the finite thickness appears in the growth rate, and not only in the growth rate, but in the mode selection as well. So it's not only the capillary length scale of the problem which sets the length scale which will uh, naturally appear in this system. No, the, the knowledge of the finite thickness uh, impedes or uh, it has consequences on uh, both the mode selection and, the, and its growth rate. So that's important for us because, so yeah, that's just an illustration in fact, using, uh, so this is, this is a relatively uh, analogous system using a hill show cell. So you see that when, when the mode selection uh, w when the thickness is small, the wavelengths will be uh, much larger than the, than the thickness. And in, and in the end of uh, an infinitely thin layer, you see that the two interfaces couple to each other to cancel anything. The growth rate goes to zero when H goes to zero, and the uh, selected mode goes to uh, zero as well. So there is a continuity with the fact that when the layer disappears, the instability of the layer disappears as well. That was missed by Taylor. That's not the only thing he has missed in his career, but since he has done many other things, we, for we forgive him. All right, so uh, we know the acceleration of the base state. We know the uh, growth rate of the corresponding instability. The piercing criterion, as usual, is just that when the gain of the instability is such, is of order unity, let's say, well, fluctuations have grown up to the thickness of the, uh, the, the initial thickness of the layer. The, the instability uh, has um, pierced the interface, and this is indeed what happens. If you look at uh, the growing shell uh, growing just, just before you, just in facing you, then you see that, so initially it was smooth, then it develops roughnesses, so these roughnesses are the sign of the developing thickness modulation instability. And at some point, uh, the thickness modulations pierce the, uh, uh, the, the shell, which is, uh, what you see here is a, is a network of ligaments, because uh, in between the ligaments there are holes. All right. So the uh, stability criterion, if you, if you compute the growth rate, then you get that there is a fundamental. That one is, is not a Schlieren. This is a backward, ah. uh, a backward thing. But this is the corresponding bubbles or uh, this uh, is on the uh, What? This uh, corresponds to the exploding uh, bubbles. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ah. Sure, sure, sure. We're, we're sitting just in front of it. It's not dangerous, it's you know, no, no. Marangoni told it. Uh, initial stage. I, yeah, initial stage up to the uh, sheet piercing. The, 
this, um, uh, I would say, five <coughs> millimeters in that case, smaller than a centimeter. All right, so uh, the, when you compute the, the, the gain and stuff, you, 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 you discover that you have a, a number, which it's is called a Weber number. What's your point? No, no, that, he, that everybody is disregarding him and telling him he's not sufficiently assertive as a child. No, no, he is. He is no problem. I'm, 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 I've seen him. Okay. <laughs> I like to play the rules. I'm trying to speed up. All right, so the, the mode selection is exactly the same since we have an expression for the mode. Uh, versus the acceleration, um, so the, the, the selective wave wavelengths as a function of the uh, acceleration. We know that the acceleration of the shell, how it depends on time. And we remember that the radius goes like the cube of time, so r dot dot is an increasing function of time, so we know everything of that. And when, when, when we have reached the, 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 the uh, uh, Pursing criterion, this corresponds to a particular uh, mode, a, a particular wavelength, which of course is, is decreasing as the expansion measured by this Weber number is, uh, is uh, more violent. All right. And we have an is illustration there. You, uh, this is a large Weber number, a smaller Weber number, and even smaller Weber number there. So the density of holes measured by this wavelength is typically uh, given by this Weber number. So what would this correspond to? The, the, the most left one. The most left one is probably a, a, one of these two points. We have chosen this so that it is representative. What is the scale bar of the lower left? The? What is the scale bar of the lower left? So uh, that's five millimeters. So this, this answers your, your point. OK. Um, we're not yet there because we have understood why the uh, sheet pierces. This is because it modulates its uh, thickness via an instability. We, are not, we have not described the fragments yet. So once the sheet is pierced, um, on the edge of the sheet, the surface tension forces are no more balanced. And that was described by Taylor. 1959, correctly, by the way. <laughs> uh, and, and so he has explained why holes on uh, uh, sheets tend to open spontaneously. But th since we have made holes on the sheet uh, at uh, nearby places, well, these holes, by growing, uh, ultimately they are forming a kind of uh, a net of ligaments. These ligaments are columnar liquid structures. These columnar structures are sensitive to the Rayleigh plateau instability, the capillary instability, and therefore they produce the droplets. So this is the way uh, the fragments are formed. Excuse me, is there any thermal effect in this explosion? Thermal? Because, mm. because you probably have very hot gas. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, the, the liquid has no time to heat at all. These are compl this is completely negligible. Water, as you know, it takes a lot of heat to uh, increase its temperature. Uh, the quantity of, um, <coughs> of heat released there is enough to accelerate the gases, to, <coughs> to produce a pressure which accelerates the whole thing, but not within uh, such a very short time not to heat up anything. So there is no importance, th there is no <coughs> impact uh, of evaporation, boiling, or any stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the steam is there. <coughs> what I have not described, but we could go into details, the sheet has completely atomized by the time the flame front has reached it, but it has not reached the sheet yet that the sheet is completely transformed into droplets already. So the, the steam has not reached anything. Yet. Right. <coughs> I'm interrupted all the time, so... Um, yeah. All right. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we, since we have a, a description of this typical distance between the holes, we know the thickness of the film, then we know the uh, typical diameter of the droplets by conservation. We know even more of that because our previous uh, work has shown that depending on the way 
these <coughs> columnar ligament structures are prepared, you end up with fragments which are <coughs> narrowly distributed inside or broadly distributed in size. Of course, uh, ligaments which are more rough will give rise to a broader broad, uh, drop size distribution in the end. And this is exactly what happens. So the distribution is uh, something. And as you can see, and maybe contrary to the intuition we could have had from the start of this problem, moderate expansion rates give rise to distribution of fragments which are broader than more violent uh, expansions. So when, when the sizes are rescaled by the uh, average size, because, and this is something that now we can understand, because when the holes are close to each other, when these rims of the rolls, when they collide, they collide gently, producing structures which are smooth and therefore this drop size distribution which are narrow as compared to the case when the rims come from are very distant from each other and when they collide they collide uh, violently producing uh, corrugated ligaments and therefore broader distributions so this is so gentle expansions give rise to broader fragments all right um, so as i said i was extremely disappointed not to speak about solids so let me anyway <laughs> illustrate exactly the same problem involving not fluids but solids so it's a necklace of um, magnets this is exactly the same as you know uh, as you can see the same preoccupation well the same the same idea starting with a very simple geometry expanding it and looking at how the fragments built no, no, it's just oh, falling on its own weight. Uh, and since the necklace sits on a cone, there is a, a radial expansion. So th there is also the, um, so yeah, it's an inverse cascade. An inverse cascade because we first form the small fragments. So this is the liquid version of it because I, I need to come back to the liquid <laughs> session. Um, it's when the cohesion is ensured uh, not by magnetic forces but by um, uh, surface tension forces. So as you see, there is, a, there is an expansion here. These two guys wanted to separate, but they have been attracted by the liquid bridge so that they have been aggregated into the uh, next uh, fragments. So there is an identical phenomenology. The phenomenology being, and the uh, experiment I have shown is illustrative of that, that Contrary to the usual view of fragmentation, where you start with a big stone and you break it sequentially down to the smaller pieces, the experiments I have shown rather suggest that you first form the atoms, the smallest pieces achievable by the system, and that by the existence of cohesion, and these pieces undergo an inverse cascade to form the fragments, this inverse cascade being interrupted for some reason at some point. So this is the truth, and this is how nature works, as, as opposed to what we had been thinking nature works. I think you're disappointed. Yes, you're disappointed, because I've just made a statement, which is, anyway. <laughs> they, <laughs> any fees, any, any fest has to end with fireworks. And the fireworks <laughs> are exactly the opposite of the statement I have just made. So this is one of the rare instances in nature where you start from a big drop to through a sequence of um, uh, successive breakups form the tiny pieces and the final fragments. But this is one of the rare instances I've been able to, to watch and study. All the others are more uh, complying to the rule that you first form the atoms and that cohesion results in an inverse aggregation Sorry, cascade. What exactly is that? That's, that's um, I mean, I have, I have no time to describe it. 
that's, that, that's what the uh, Japanese called fireworks. This is a hand firework. Um, this is a black powder which has been heated because of the, so the black powder contains carbon. Carbon reacts with the oxygen of air <coughs> through an extremely <coughs> exothermic chemical reaction. The heat released by this reaction heats up this powder which melts, which becomes liquid, and since it incorporates volatile substances and has its temperature which increases, nucleates bubbles inside. The bubbles reach the surface of this, what they call mother drop. They, uh, uh, ex they, 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 the, the cavity uh, explodes, they eject the jet, and the jet fragments into smaller pieces. These smaller pieces are droplets, which in turn start reacting with the oxygen of air, reproducing sequentially exactly what happened first. So you see here there are three or four uh, stages of the cascade. All these are traces of tiny droplets. So th that was a droplet. It has burst there, ejecting another one here. The other one there has heated because it reacted with the oxygen of air and has burst by ejecting another droplet and so on to viscosity, as the other would say. So these are, these are, these are traces of uh, droplets. There is an arborescent, if you like, an arborescent uh, cascade down to very small sizes. It's molten potassium nitrate or carbon is not molten? I'm sure. So it's, it's potassium nitrate molten with chunks of carbon in it? Yep, exactly. The black powder is that. Okay. okay. <laughs>